Hello, I'm Tony DiMaria, editor of JAG. Now there are uh, several papers in press that I'd like to talk to you about. You probably remember the FAME study demonstrating that ischemia-guided PCA using fractional flow reserve to uh, localize the ischemic area resulted in a better one-year outcome compared to conventional angiography-guided PCA for patients with multivessel disease. In a new paper, investigators in Korea used registry data to determine the impact of ischemia-guided revascularization with myocardial perfusion imaging for patients with multivessel coronary disease. The study population included 2,500 patients who underwent PCI and another 2,500 who underwent cabbage. Of these, fewer than one-half underwent SPEC and 17% underwent ischemia-guided revascularization. Pre-procedural spec ischemia-guided revascularization decreased the five-year risk of major adverse cardiac and cerebrovascular events. This was primarily driven by fewer reports of revascularization post-MI, but no significant difference was seen after cabbage. Other outcomes were comparable. The registry data did involve a longer follow-up than the two-year uh, data from the FAME trial. The evidence suggests that ischemia-guided revascularization using SPEC appears to reduce the risk of repeat revascularization, particularly in patients with multivessel disease who undergo PCI with drug-eluting stenting. A second paper looks at the important topic of high untreatment platelet reactivity with clopidogrel. We know from Triton, Timmy38, and Plato that some patients just don't achieve optimal platelet inhibition after PCI with clopidogrel, and this is associated with adverse events. There is a rationale to think that ACS patients exhibiting high untreatment platelet reactivity might be the ideal candidates for treatment with a stronger agent like ticagrelor or prosegrel. Now a team from Greece has performed the first direct pharmacodynamic comparison of ticagrelor with prosegrel in this setting. The primary endpoint of platelet reactivity at the end of two treatment periods was lower for ticagrelor, while the secondary endpoint of high untreatment platelet reactivity rate was similar in the groups. No patient exhibited a major bleeding event with either treatment group. So both ticagrelor and prosegrel effectively treat high untreatment platelet reactivity. However, we'll need a few other studies before we know whether the pharmacodynamic differences seen in these papers translates into differences in clinical efficacy or safety. The third paper I want to mention is entitled A Relationship of Beta Blocker Dose with Outcomes in Ambulatory Heart Failure Patients with Systolic Dysfunction. And these represent data from the HF Action Trial, the Heart Failure Action Trial. Now, despite guidelines, it remains unclear whether there is a dose-response relationship between beta blockers and outcomes in the setting of heart failure, despite the fact that the guidelines recommend maximal beta blocker dosage. The HF Action uh, study was designed to test the effects of exercise training versus usual care in heart failure patients with moderate to severe left ventricular systolic dysfunction. And fortunately, the vast majority of these patients were on beta blockers. Now, these investigators found a significant relationship between beta blocker dose and the adjusted risk for the primary outcome of all-cause death or hospitalization. And in fact, there was a linear benefit to a 50 milligram daily dose equivalent of carvedilol. However, there was no significant relationship between dose and the secondary outcomes after adjusting for other clinical variables. Patients with a higher baseline beta blocker dose also demonstrated longer exercise duration and higher peak VO2 at three months. 
So these data support the current clinical guidelines recommendation that beta blocker therapy should be titrated to moderate to high doses as used in randomized controlled clinical trials. For Inside Jack, I'm Tony DeMario.